Hey y'all, Jake Bible here. Thank you for listening to the original podcast recording of Dead Mech that I released way back in 2009. I've had a lot of folks ask for these original recordings, so I thought I'd put them back out there for y'all to enjoy. The episodes will be released weekly for free, but if you don't want to wait, then head over to jakebible.substack.com and subscribe. Links are in the show notes. Paid subscribers receive access to all 26 episodes right now. And that's not all. Subscribers receive access to early release ebooks, getting them before they even go on sale in my online store or any of the retail sites, plus early access to new audiobooks, exclusive short stories, including the weekly Friday Night Drabble Party, live readings, and so much more. That's jakebible.substack.com. Subscribe now and get all the goods. Now, enjoy a little bit of the past. Thank you. You're listening to Jake Bible's Dead Mech, the world's first Drabble novel, written and performed by Jake Bible. This story is available only as a podcast novel and is not for the faint of heart. If you can't stand blood, gore, graphic violence, foul language, cannibalism, zombie hordes, or sexual situations, well then, you aren't invited to this party. For more details and info, go to jakebible.com. Feel free to leave your mark there. It's only fair. Episode 1, The Prologue. Part 1, The Virus. It would be decades after the restructuring of human society before records were found declaring that the virus that caused the zombie apocalypse was not the first. It wasn't even the second. According to scientific records, there have been at least four earlier outbreaks of related viruses. Government organizations have been successful in all cases until the final virus. Prevailing theory was the virus's mutation finally outran the scientists. The final mutation was all the virus needed to survive. It is unknown how many people were spreading the virus among the world's population before the first carrier died and reanimated. It is believed that every member of the human species became a dormant carrier of the virus. Thus, every human that died came back as a reanimated corpse. No cure could be found, no recourse. However, worse than the fact that people knew their body would come back as a voracious nightmare was the discovery that a bite from a zombie would mean death and reanimation within 24 hours, and that those bitten became contagious within 12 hours, infecting friends, family, co-workers, anyone they in turn bit. And bite they did. No exceptions, no remorse, no reasoning. Madness was unleashed. Only one thing could be confirmed regarding the virus. Everyone infected became a zombie. No one was spared. No matter what antiviral drugs were used, immunosuppressants, gene therapies, nothing worked. Nothing even slowed it down. Once the living died, it took less than 20 minutes for the corpse to reanimate with only two things on its mindless brain, kill and eat. Killing seemed to be its first priority. Feeding would not distract the virus-driven undead from their need to kill. Too many citizens learned the hard way thinking a zombie was distracted by flesh, thinking they had a chance. The zombies the virus created were not shuffling foot draggers, but active, homicidal, very hungry reanimated corpses, bent on killing every human they could and feasting on their flesh. They were unbelievably strong and fast. They were driven to kill first and foremost. This ensured the supreme dominance of the virus. Feeding was secondary. And feeding on fresh flesh was the key. While never proven substantially, the belief was that the zombie was able to feed off the energy still stored. Old, decaying, rotten flesh was of no interest to the zombies. Thus, they did not feed off each other. The zombie physiology differed greatly from its original human form. No longer were organs needed for survival, since they could not digest or process what they caught. All energy, all sustenance went into building and maintaining connective tissues. While bones could not be reset, they could be healed. The break fusing and strengthening, tendons, cartilage, ligaments, and muscle could be rebuilt and regrown. As long as the zombie fed, the zombie stayed fit and deadly. This was another triumph of the virus. It gave the zombies a sense of self, a reason to fight, to kill, to feed, to survive. 
The virus learned and encouraged learning. It had the potential to allow its victims, the zombie hordes, to process, store, and analyze information. It was a stripped-down, simplistic way of reasoning, but the zombies could think and learn. They learned to hunt in packs. They learned to split up, to surround their prey, to actively catch their victims instead of just running them down. They learned to listen, to smell, to watch. They learned to be predators, not just scavengers. Worst of all, they learned their limitations and adjusted accordingly. The fast pursued, the slow waited, the broken hid. The speed with which the virus took control of a dead body astonished the doctors and researchers assigned to find the cure. In minutes, their test subjects would go from corpse to zombie, ready to kill, eat, and kill some more. Too many lab assistants and eminent scientists lost their lives by underestimating the power and scope of the virus. Soon many of the researchers became the researched. Their reanimated corpses dissected and studied using protocols and procedures they themselves had created. By the time the virus was isolated, nearly half the world's population had succumbed. The other half cowered. Part 2. Society Reborn Population centers were the first to go. The density of people made it impossible to control the spread of the virus. Within months, both the east and west coasts were lost. Communication with Europe, Asia, the Middle East, and other world regions soon amounted to sporadic info bursts from shortwave stations. Eventually, those too ceased. The seat of power was moved to deep within the Colorado Rockies. What was NORAD became the United Defense Council. The UDC hunkered down and waited, issuing surgical tactical strikes to the former great cities of the nation. Most of the country became uninhabitable. Nuclear cleansing was the only option for many population centers. Up and down the east and west coast and places in between, cities were laid to waste, their poison scoured from the planet. New York, LA, Chicago, DC, Atlanta, San Diego, Seattle, Denver, Philadelphia, Boston, Portland, all gone. What was left of the country was called the wastelands. For a generation, humankind became hermits, forced into indoor seclusion to avoid the toxic air and rains that swept through. When they emerged and the rolling skies didn't produce boils and blisters upon their exposed skin, they found themselves lost. The Wastelands. Deadly gas clouds, acid rain, freak megastorms, earthquakes, scorched earth. This was what the human race had to fight through to survive. Before the city-states, many lived in caves, burrowed under buildings, adding basement levels as needed, found sanctuaries in the mountains. Even fighting for their lives, they still fought to preserve history and society. When they did emerge, they brought their memories with them. But those memories were just that, memories. Not instructions, not plans, not a future. The UDC gave them all that. And for their trouble, the UDC only asked for complete loyalty. Human civilization and society had never been about money, race, gender, looks, or even power. It had always been about class. When society finally started to pull itself back together after the first dark years of the zombie virus, it pulled itself along class lines. Small city-states formed, walls went up, armaments placed. It became the battle of the urban versus the rural all over again. Once those left outside realized they had been abandoned, it was almost too late. Some pockets survived, but most didn't. The brutal took control and ruled, as much inside the walls as outside. Frontier Town, Adventureland, Six Flags, Windy City, Foggy Bottom. These were the city-states left under UDC control. Each had its own set of laws, ruling structures, police security forces, judicial systems. Each survived alone, on their own resources and the energies of their respective populations. But the final word on all matters of survival came from the UDC. They had the troops, the guns, the bombs, the technology to effectively hold back the zombies roaming the wastelands. There were many more city-states at one time, but most ignored the UDC, choosing to make their own way. They chose death. Even with the small size of the city-states, all it took was one or two deceased to get overlooked and an epidemic quickly spread within the walls. The Reaper chip became a necessity for human survival. The UDC controlled the chip's application with an iron fist. Thus, the UDC ignored the rural survivor pockets and focused on the main centers of population. 
This left the survivors on the outside of the walls to fend for themselves, to develop their own warning systems and protocols. Mixed rural fear with religious zealotry, and a new scourge was born. The cults. Trade routes were established quickly between the city-states, each sending out heavily armed convoys through the wastelands that separated human society. In the beginning, the losses that resulted from these trading expeditions were worth it. Resources were scarce, and each city-state seemed to have many strengths, but no city-state could provide everything for its populace. However, once the cults figured out the trade schedules, the losses soon outweighed any benefits. Communication and physical trade between the city-states dwindled until each became their own self-sufficient fiefdom. Those that dared to trade did so at their own risk. The cults only believed that their people should be allowed to live. All others were heathens and infidels, the very reason the virus was brought upon humanity. Those survivors that were unfortunate enough to cross paths with the cults met with ends some said were a million times worse than being eaten alive by a horde of zombies. Tales of vivisection, cannibalism, being burnt alive, weeks of rape and mutilation were spread through the slow grapevine that worked the land. Often by the time a message reached a small group, it was too late to flee. The cults were upon them. Part 3. Warnings and Weapons the UDC realized they needed two things to survive, better warning and better weapons. They already had the weapons. Technology that was on the drawing board before the zombie apocalypse decimated the Earth was still viable. The mechs. Massive, armored combat robots designed to fit around a human pilot and mimic the pilot's every move and action. However, there were design flaws with the control interface. Developing the warning wasn't very hard. The Reaper chip came about in a burst of brilliance. That same burst of brilliance showed the chip to be the answer to the mech pilot's control issues. The beauty of the zombie hordes was once they ran out of food, they simply starved to death. This allowed the human race to bounce back from almost certain extinction. The virus, however, did not die with the reanimated corpses. It floated in the air, waiting for the living to expire and provide the perfect host. It was a patient, indestructible virus. Once the Reaper chip was invented and implanted in every living person, humanity had an early warning system. Trackers locked onto the recently deceased and squads dispatched to dispose of the threat. But nothing is ever that simple. The Reaper chip was to be the saving grace of the human race. It was to solve all of the unreported deaths, the overlooked, the lost, the underbelly. But that wasn't to be. In theory, a person died and the Reaper chip activated, alerting the authorities. It also sent a lethal shock to the cerebral cortex, frying the brain and adding another safeguard that the dearly departed stayed dearly departed. But in order for mech pilots to connect with their mech's computer, they needed that feature disabled. Eventually, it was, and the door for the dead mechs was opened. Wide. The mechs came online ten years after the Reaper chip. They were almost a direct extension of that technology working on the same principle of cerebral and computer integration. The first mech pilot died a quick, painful death, his cerebellum frying like an oyster in hot oil. It was chalked up to equipment failure. A second mech pilot died screaming into his calm that his brain is on fucking fire. His eyeballs melted in his head while gray matter oozed from his ears. The scientists and engineers went back to the drawing board. UDC waited patiently for their army. Try as they might, none of the scientists or programmers could retain the Reaper chip's brain-frying features and allow it to fully connect with the mech's computer systems without killing the pilots. They finally had to face the fact that the feature would need to be disabled, still allowing the pilot's vital signs to be monitored and tracking signature to be located, but no longer capable of administering a final brain death. A single assistant composed a memo about the possible risks of pilot death while still connected to their mech. The assistant soon became a silent test subject. A mech and his pilot were designed to be one single organism. The mech's AI and the pilot's consciousness were to meld easily, allowing the pilot to control the mech without any delay or hesitation. If the pilot moved, the mech moved with it, like a suit of armor, but with hydraulic assistance. This was the worry of what would one day be called the lost memo, that the mech and pilot were too intertwined, too enmeshed, too complete. Mechs did not know the difference between life or death. A pilot was a pilot, whether living or undead. 
monsters were born. The day the mechs came online was hailed as the end of the zombie war, the politicians crowed. No longer would humanity have to risk sending in hundreds of soldiers against thousands of undead, hoping not to be overrun and infected, then turn themselves. Now, just two or three specially trained mech pilots could take their massive robotic war machines into the middle of the undead masses and lay waste. Soon battles were won in minutes and hours, not days and weeks. Of course, it all went horribly wrong the moment the first pilot died while still operating his mech. Part 4. The Dead Mechs Essential to the mech's operation was a modified Reaper chip, which allowed the pilot to have near-complete cerebral integration with all of the mech's systems, creating response times of nanoseconds. The mech became a 50-ton extension of the pilot's reflexes. Pilots didn't think, they acted. No one foresaw that a mech could become a 50-ton extension of a zombie, and that zombie was as hungry as all the rest, except now equipped with city-leveling armaments. Zombie pilots did not need to sleep or piss or ever leave their cockpits. They could hunt 24-7. And they did. The first observed dead mech was a berserker. The mech's former pilot, now zombie, raged as hard as any other zombie not strapped into a 50-ton machine. It turned on anything and everything in its path, smashing, destroying, annihilating. It fired its weapons at random. The zombie pilot no longer in control of its faculties, the military training lost in death. And just like the zombies crawling the earth without mech armor, the dead mech pilot was hungry. The need for flesh forced the mech to learn, to gain control of itself. The metal golem was free and starving. The dead mechs roamed the wastelands, searching for food. They could cover several square miles a day where a zombie horde could only move so far so fast. This led to some of the smaller wasteland outposts, the rural survivors, to be taken by surprise when the mech approaching turned out not to be friendly, but instead hungry for their flesh. Now a good, strong, reinforced wall couldn't hold out the horror. Little communities had to abandon their hard work and search for others to join forces with, whether they wanted to or not, all for the sake of survival. Part 5. The Ride and Arrival Mech pilots weren't chosen for being the bravest, for being the smartest, or for being the best fit. They were chosen because they volunteered, and no one else did. That didn't mean that everyone that signed up was accepted. There were still minimum standards, such as physical ability, intelligence, resourcefulness, and most of all, sanity. Sanity was key. They weren't going to let you be in charge of enough firepower to level a city-state without making sure you wouldn't actually level a city-state, unless ordered to. So tests were designed. The biggest test? The ride to the mech base. Once a pilot candidate was singled out from their city-state, they boarded a train to the mech base. This train was designed to do only two things. Get the pilot candidate to the base and use every tool available to break that candidate before they got there. Once on board, the candidate was secluded in a windowless passenger car. There was one seat only, bolted to the floor in the middle of the empty car. The candidate would be instructed to strap in and remain strapped in until instructed otherwise. They would be left that way for 24 hours. Most pilot candidates failed the first part of the test within six hours. It's why the train never left the station until the first 24 hours were up. Movement and sound would be simulated, making the candidate think that they were on their way, but at no point would they be communicated or interacted with for the entire 24 hours. If they undid a strap, moved from their chair, begged to be let out, or just flat broke down, then the test was ended immediately. They were thanked and sent home. The majority failed because they refused to piss their pants. If the candidate made it past the first test, then the train would start its long journey to the mech base. This time the simulation was opposite. Instead of faking movement and sound, it faked stillness and quiet. The candidate would be told there was a mechanical issue and the train would be stopped for at least 24 hours, when in actuality it was moving at a steady clip of 85 miles per hour. The candidate would be allowed to move about, to use the small latrine bucket provided, and to eat from the ration packets attached to the chair. For the candidate, the train ride to the mech base was a four-day trip. 
no matter where they were coming from. The first day they are stuck in the station but think they are moving. The second day they think they are stuck in the wasteland but are actually moving. The third day they think they are moving, actually are moving, and are given every opportunity to relax and ask questions. The train's pilot and co-pilot are allowed to communicate with the candidate, as long as they stay on script. The fourth day, the candidate thinks they will die. The third day of testing is merely designed to lull the candidate into a false sense of security, ease their minds and put them off guard. Then they are hit with the fourth day, the day they die. The train never stops moving once it leaves the station, but the candidate believes it does on day two and four. When they are told the train has been attacked on day four, they feel the attack. Every last blast, ricochet, and concussion. They are watched. Watched for how they react, how they try to help, and how they try to escape. Once the train is in motion, the candidate will not be returned for any reason. They are on their way to the mech base, and that is where they will be assigned and where they will stay. Whether they become a mech pilot or not is the question. The test is simple. If the candidate can figure out how to get out of the train car, they will become a pilot. If they don't figure it out or don't try, then there are plenty of other jobs at the mech base. The fourth day weeds the pilots from the cooks. On arriving at the mech base, the candidate is stripped of his or her name. They are known only as the rookie. Only one rookie is allowed at the base at a time. This keeps the confusion down and also keeps valuable resources from being drained or wasted by rookie mistakes. Until they are given back their name, they are the lowest on the totem pole. Even if they are training as a mech pilot, they are above no one. From food service to maintenance, the rookie is the base's bitch. Some make it just fine. Some don't. Most don't. You have been listening to Jake Bible's Dead Mech, the world's first Drabble novel. The preceding episode was recorded and produced by the author. The intro music was Miles and Miles by Lake Acres. Outro music is Destroy by The Eternal. Both tracks available at podsafeaudio.com. Title graphic by Ed Delaney. Find him at peculiarcomics.com. This recording is protected by a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivative works, United States 3.0 license. You can share it, copy it, and give it to anyone you want. Just don't edit it, change it, or try to make any money off it without direct permission from the author. Thank you for listening. My head is spinning. Thank you for listening to this episode of the re-release of the original podcast of Dead Mech. Don't want to wait until next week for a new episode? Go subscribe at jakebible.substack.com and you'll get access to all episodes right now. Or you can go to my website or any major retailer and get the audiobook narrated by Julie Hoverson. You can also get the ebook, which is free on all major retailer sites, as well as my own store. Go to jakebible.com for more info. Thanks, y'all. Cheers.